Hi, I'm Tara from Marathon Mates. Well, we've been there and done that. And then on this episode of The Flying Runner, we are going to hear all about Tony and Lucia's Sydney Marathon experience. From getting on stage and talking at the expo, to the huge crowds and the awesome experiences that they had. We're going to hear it all. On this episode, we are recapping the Sydney Marathon and you get to ex- and you'll get to experience the weekend from their perspective as runners at Australia's biggest running event. Are you ready to run? Let's go. Welcome to the thrilling world of the Flying Runner, brought to you by the Marathon Mates. everyone and welcome to episode number 64 of the Flying Runner podcast. This week we are going to recap the Sydney Marathon weekend. We're lucky to be joined by Tony and Lucia who both participated in the weekend and tonight they will give you first-hand experience on what they saw and how they ran. We'll also have a chat about the event itself and whether or not they believe that it should be a world marathon major event. However, before we do that, let me welcome my co-hosts to this podcast. Mm -hmm. Joining me tonight is my other half, Tim, along with Lucia and Tony. Guys, how are you? And without giving away too much, how was your weekend in Sydney? Yeah, it's been good. The weekend was a bit quiet, I think. (laughs) (laughs) Did you miss park run or something, Lucia? I, I know, I, yeah, because, because I had to do a shakeout run um, with my run club because there was a big race on in Sydney yesterday, so kind of had to do that. Fair enough. Saturday. Yeah, it's a long way to come for a training run. That's what I'll say. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Long, Tim, long what a, Tim, before we get into the uh, actual reason why we're here, do you want to talk about our weekend of running? Yeah, we had a pretty quiet week actually leading into it and there's a number of reasons why which we don't necessarily need to go into but we just had a a quiet week um, and uh, as a result we did some volunteering this week at Bunyaville. Both Tara and I, we actually enjoyed it. So we're four weeks out from, or less than that, three weeks when this episode airs from Chicago. So uh, we're feeling comfortable and and happy with where we're at and it was nice to just sort of have, have a bit of a rest week before we start to hit the, the big events that we've got coming up. I tried to work out the kilometres that we've got to run there, Tara, and I, I lost count after about 110 kilometres, I think. So what is it? It's a, a full marathon, a half marathon, a full marathon, two 5K events and two park runs is what we'll end up doing in this trip. So it's 120-odd kilometres. So we're plus just uh, we're just plus the rest of walking. <laughs> so yeah, just a restful week, I guess, and getting our bodies ready for what's coming up. So um, yeah, that's that was us. Pretty easy, pretty quiet. Excellent, excellent. Well, we'll get to the news, and then we will get to the real reason why we're here. So let's go for the news. Excellent. Tim, so what's been happening around the world of running over the past few days? Uh, Well, in Australia, there's only been one big event here, Tara, and that has been the Sydney Marathon over the weekend. And I know Lucia and Tony have both completed it because they've got medals hanging around their necks right now, but uh, we won't give too much away on that just yet. But what I can say is uh, we, we observed over the weekend the two fastest times on Australian soil by uh, men and by female. Um, in the men's race, uh, Brimen Kapora Misoy ran a time of 2.06.19. Now, you have to say that is a world-class time. Uh, it's not Kelvin uh, Kiptum or, or Iliad Kipchoge pace, but it's uh, it's right up there, 2.06.19. 
Uh, fastest time ever recorded in Australia, a new course record for Sydney Marathon as well. Thanks. Uh, in the women's results, uh, Wakanesh Adisa Gumesa ran the time of 2 hours 21 and 41 seconds to set a new course record and the fastest women's time on Australian soil. Uh, she um, beat the Australian record by about two minutes. In second place was Ruti Agarsora with a time of 2 hours 23 and 10 seconds. And third place was Gautiam Gabrielase Teklased guy <laughs> with a time of two hours 24 17 now got him uh was the actual favorite before the race um but wakanesh uh ran it in two hours 21 again a world-class time um and i guess looking at the men's and women's time we are seeing some super quick times there which is fantastic to see uh in the men's wheelchair josh cassidy wheeled his way around the course in a time of one hour 38 to go back to back and win it two years in a row and in the women's wheelchair, our our favourite, Tara, uh, Maddie DeRosio, who we've met a number of times, uh, ran, uh, wheeled her way around for a back-to-back -back victory in one hour 54. Uh, she only competed at the Paralympics Marathon a week prior, travelled on an aeroplane back to Australia, jet lag and all, and was able to, to win the race there. So a fantastic event there and um, very quick time. So really... Um, really enjoyed watching it i guess and a um, couple of things i guess i noticed um on the on the television coverage was um how how professional the coverage was it was uh on par if not better than last year and it was on sbs they held the coverage for at least an hour hour and a half after the professionals or the elites crossed the finish line uh so you got to see a number of the the next lot of runners come through which was fantastic um, a couple of areas where I think they could improve on watching it on TV. One, they had professional paces. So Liam Adams went out for the first 10 Ks. He was wearing his tradie singlet. Um, and, and then there was a number of other professional paces that got off the course at 30 Ks. Even in the women's, there were some prof professional paces. They weren't wearing any singlets that identified them as paces. And it was very hard to actually see them in amongst the crowd of runners, which ones the paces were. So it'd be good to see that. Um, the TV coverage did stuff up the wheelchair start. They had a cameraman right there on the start line taking video of all the wheelchairs as they uh, fired the gun and literally got in the way of the wheelchair races as they started. So that wouldn't be too fun. Um, and the bigger bibs, I think the bibs themselves are probably a little small for the TV. And as a result, it was, struggle, it was a struggle to see the names on the bibs. Yeah, so on the TVs. I know you're holding yours up there, Lucia. Um, but yeah, it was very difficult to see the names of the runners. A couple of things I did like about the television coverage as well is that they actually provided live Garmin updates through the race of the elite runners, of a couple of the elite runners. So one of the things I noticed was, uh, I think the one of the men that they had in the lead pack, uh, they were showing his heart rate, which was about 165 beats per minute. And that was at about 30 Ks. And his stride length of about 190 steps, uh, not a stride length, his um, up steps per Cadence. minute. Cadence. Cadence um, was about 190 steps per minute. And then, yeah, they showed um, one of the females as well. Her, her, her heart rate was at 155. So it was just amazing to see that. Um, the other thing I really liked was they had a, or they attempted to have a live on course feed from one of the runners running on the course and she was doing it off her phone but unfortunately it kept breaking up so the coverage couldn't really make use of that um we did see our friend Haley Piermont. uh Haley is the indigenous marathon um uh representative we've met her before in berlin we've had her on the show before in the past when we were in berlin tony if you remember but um yeah she was on the tv and we got to see her little episode there as well uh, and one one little snippet we saw was uh, Maddie DeRosio saying that she'll be in New York. So they're sort of the key highlights that I got out of the uh, the marathon. I know we'll talk more about it shortly as well. Um, for those of our listeners who don't understand why Sydney is such a big deal at becoming a world marathon major, uh, the New South Wales government has come out in the last week or so saying uh, that they reckon that if it became a, a world marathon major, it would boost the economy in Sydney by over $300 million in the next decade. Um, 
they reckon by 2027, the growth um, of participants and the, the fact that it would be a major would mean that it would bring in about $26 million to the economy for that one weekend in Sydney. And to be honest, I reckon it will be a lot higher than that. I reckon with the amount of travel that people take, um, the extra travel that they do whilst they're in the country, the food, the restaurants, the hotels, um, the merchandise that they purchase, I, I would say it's more than $26 million that's added to the economy. Um, but yeah, it's phenomenal what it can do. Excellent. Um, no, there's uh, one other thing I'd like to talk about on the news, Tara, before I hand it back to you. Oh, sorry. Um, yep. Yep. Can so I'm... Cape Town Marathon. Yep. Sorry, let you go for it. Sorry, Tim. Just to circle back on Sydney, I've got it on very good authority that it's pretty much a certainty that Sydney will be a major and the announcement's going to happen in November. So something terrible would have to go wrong, but all it's pretty much a certainty that Sydney will become a major. Yeah, and I think that's pretty evident from the way it was presented on the weekend. They didn't do anything wrong. Probably the, the, the weakest part of it was probably the lack of crowds early in the morning, but the crowds definitely picked up through the day from what I could see. Um, now, the other one, which is... The other candidate race which is coming up shortly is Cape Town Marathon. Cape Town Marathon is the other candidate race city, as is Chengdu in China. Uh, and just like Sydney, Cape Town's been increasing its numbers over the last couple of years to really increase their participation numbers. And during the week, Cape Town Marathon has come back saying that they've officially sold out of their marathon entries uh, just over a month from the start of, of their race. They've hit their cap of 20,000 entries and they've announced that they'll accept another 1,000 entries into the event. Uh, so this is only fantastic news. This is great news for the sport. It's great news for uh, people like us who like to travel and run in different parts of the world. Uh, and I've got my fingers crossed that Cape Town can become a major. At some point, obviously, I want to see Sydney become the next major, but uh, I, I think we'll find that Cape Town will follow pretty soon thereafter and there'll be eight majors um, probably by the 2027 or 2028 i would imagine that's awesome news hey the more medals that we get to add to our collection <laughs> the better it is isn't it that's what we're running that's for it. so yeah excellent thanks thanks for that news this week tim um let's focus on the topic of the week um so guys let's get started lucia i'm going to ask you a question if that's all right how did you go up on stage? I didn't. I saw some videos and I saw some photos. You looked like you were having an absolute wonderful time. I've got to admit, I was so nervous leading up to it because people ask me, how are you feeling? I'm like, I'm more worried about speaking on stage than I was at, actually about the mm -hmm. marathon itself. Um, I was quite lucky. I managed to drag some friends to make them come to the expo and watch me speak. Um, so, so they had a small stage area set up but a lot more people watched than i had anticipated would i reckon all up it was about 20 people actually stayed to um listen to me so i was lucky i was interviewed by someone i know which is which is one of the ambassadors of the marathon thank god we had a time limit i, I, I just could have kept on talking um all my friends that were there they're like you did not sound nervous at all and then later um and then after i was finished my spiel I was talking with the marathon guys and they were just impressed with how I spoke. I had my picture um, on the background. Everyone was everyone was excited that I actually brought my six-star medal with me there and I took it out as well. Um, one of the questions which some of our listeners, which know me well, will have a good laugh at, one of the questions I could ask was, what, what does my recovery look like? And I did have to start out saying it. What, what works for me doesn't work for everyone, so I need to make that very clear. But I said to him, I'm known for having burgers and donuts pre and post race. I'm like, it works for me, so if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Everyone got a laugh out of that. But it was just a lot of fun just talking about my journey because a lot of people say to me, oh, Luch, we find you, um, what's what I'm trying to think of, um, inspiring, motivating, and I surprisingly, I get very taken back by that. But I just I had a blast on stage. Thank God we thank God we only had a short time. Otherwise I could have kept on going. <laughs> it sounded it, like you had an awesome time. And the photos, as I said, did look really, really good up there. And I think you followed Haley Pyman, who, who's um, from the Indigenous Marathon Runners. So um yeah, you're both up there together 
for a little bit of time. Um, so I guess the other thing I want to know about is the expo. Tony, I know you love a very good expo. Tell me all about it. Well, I've got to say I was disappointed in the expo. I mean, it was well organised. It was well organised. I had 50 exhibitors, but on on it was below what you would get at the Gold Coast Expo in my mind. Oh. So um, I thought the aisles were very narrow, that you walked around, there was a bit of congestion. Um, but, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I was disappointed. And... Unfortunately, they took a leaf out of the Tokyo Marathon um, book in terms of official merchandise, so there wasn't much left by the time, um, you know, you got there on a Friday or a Saturday. Um, but, yeah, I mean, from what I understand, it was a lift from last year Massive. and talking with some of the people that we know, like Murray Ma was there from Travelling Fit, there are bigger plans for next year. But in terms of the expo, I would rate it something similar to how I would rate Tokyo at the moment. So Wow. Okay. Mm. So did no, you really. get any new gutters or anything like that? Or did you get your hair and makeup done? None of those no. sort of? No. Well, then no. it's not a real expo. All, all participants were relevant to running. So that was oh. the, the positive. But, uh, yep. yeah, I just thought, yeah, it, there's a long way to go to get that expo up to a standard of a New York or a London. Right? And just to add further to that, and as Tony mentioned, from where it was last year to where it was this year, massive improvement. One of the things which I think they could have done better in the Essex merchandise area, they had a very small checkout area. I think if they keep it in the same location, they can have bigger space and they can expand on it, but a, but a definite improvement. So and more was the, Essex was the, year and, yep. Yeah. And was the venue better this year, Lucia, being oh, at Darling Harbour than out near the airport? So much better because transport options, they, um, so basically, um, and for the listeners that aren't very familiar with Sydney, this year it was held at the International Convention Centre, which is pretty much right in the centre of the city. So transport a lot easier. You could, you could get there by train, light rail, um, car park, like, well, if you want to drive, car parking stations around so it was a lot more accessible than last year most definitely excellent and now the next question i'm going to ask i want to hear two different opinions because lucia you live in sydney what was and tony you don't so in comparison to a normal running event in sydney or a normal major tony how did you guys find that the atmosphere was around the city leading up to the marathon and stuff like that. Like we all know Boston has got that atmosphere that you just cannot replicate mm -hmm. anywhere you go. Like Boston is the place to be for a pre-marathon. How's Sydney? Luch? Uh, um, I think in general the hype wasn't, if you weren't a runner, I don't think it was appreciated what this means or meant, but the hype on race day, it felt like a major to me on race day. Okay. So I think the runners, the runners that were there for it could could definitely feel the hype. So as I mentioned earlier, um I took part in one of the in one of the official shakeout runs on the Saturday and we didn't know how many people were going to turn up. But I reckon we got about 20 people and the bulk of them were international tourists that came here just for the race. There was one guy from Mexico his 163rd marathon. And I said, why are you here? Like, why Sydney? He goes, because hopefully it will be a major and it's a good way to see a new city. Mm -hmm. So it was just great to see how many international visitors and the hype around them, they they were so excited. Excellent. And Tony? Yeah, I've got to agree. The, um, the international athletes were everywhere. And the minute you saw a, a couple of people walking down the street in their Boston jackets, you realised that it was a pretty big deal. Um, disappointed in signage and just general feel, I guess, around the place. If if you weren't, as Luke said, if you weren't a runner going specifically to some of the areas of, of the marathon, you would not have known a marathon was on. Um, okay. Start. We went to the start area on Saturday morning just to get familiar. It was like a 14-minute walk from where we were staying and there were runners everywhere. 
and you got the sense that this was something big. So there was lots of people there. There were lots of runners, lots of groups, and it's hilly around that start area. So I'm thinking they're crazy. But anyway, um, and then when you're at the x of course, there's lots of internationals. But, yeah, it, when you're in those areas, it felt like a major. It felt like something significant. But when you weren't in those areas, it was just a typical day in Sydney, I think. So Okay. So not like Boston where you knew about it in every part of the city or New York, for example, where you knew about it for the whole entire time that you're there and everything. Mm, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All righty. Um, what about the actual race day? So the precinct was a new start precinct, and I did see on the new um, on the TV that they had the world age group people warming up in an oval and stuff like that prior to. What was the start precinct like for you, Lucia, compared to last year and stuff? So much better because how they did it, it kind of reminded me of London. It's like green and red this way, blue and orange this way. So instead of colours, you had um, each person had a letter on their bib and so they had signs like A and F this way, other letters this way. So it did have that very major feel. Even though they did say they put a, a lot of extra port on, but I remember I was in the queue with a friend. We waited for about 20, 25 minutes and we still weren't in the front. Um, and, then they, and then they opened the gates of our way, then I'm like, no, nah, I, I just couldn't be bothered. So it's because because we're the big so so with the oval in, in which the world age guys were warming up, that's actually cricket oval as okay. well. So it's it had yeah, it definitely had the feel of a major setup. So they had the big screens in um each of the sections. They had people trying to rev up the crowd. Naturally when the guy saw me, my balloons, is it your birthday? Yes it is. And so then he started singing happy birthday. So it very much had the feel of a major and a big improvement on last year, definitely. Excellent, excellent. And uh, Tony, did you find that there was enough port for you and Sharon and stuff like that or <laughs> were you a bit yeah. like Lucia where it was like, yeah, no, not enough? No, I, I thought the start precinct was done really well. It okay. was very well organised. Um, probably the only challenge I saw and in, uh, in our wave or, or area was the, the port loos were sort of shaped like a U and there were lines going this way and there were lines going that way. And then they had urinals. So that's that's a that's that's but and they were talking about the urinals over the loudspeaker, but they weren't signposted. All you saw was a like a black um tarp. And I'm going yep. and Sharon was saying, What's over there? And I said, I'm don't want to lose my place in the line. I don't want to find out. Um, and they were urinals. So that would be my only criticism of the front, uh, of the start area. I thought the start was really well controlled. We got away pretty much on time as as expected. I, I know that there were some delays and, you know, we might have been five or ten below, behind, but I don't think it was a biggie. Um, for us, but yeah, I just thought the start area was really exceptionally well. But they needed to put a huge sign up for those urinals because I, I poked my head in, and there would have been twenty percent utilised. And then you look back at the lines, and there's all these blokes in the lines, and and I'm just going, my God. So, but anyway, I thought start area was really good. I thought the start line was amazing. Um, when they bring you, is it Miller Street? Um, Street. Yep. <clears throat> so they bring you out onto Miller Street and uh, you're walking towards a start and the start's just downhill and that's just a good way to start. Yeah, I it thought looks, start it, area was great. <laughs> it looks so quick, the first two kilometres down to the bridge. Um, and I've run those streets because I used to have a, an office um, that I'd visit all the time in North Sydney. So I know that area very well. But it looks so quick on the TV watching all the runners in the wheelchairs take off on those first two kilometres down that hill. A um, lot different than last year and the previous years where you've had to start with a steep uphill from the uh, from Kirribilli or where, Milson's Point all the so, way up. So let's recap the actual race itself. Um, I'll just let you guys go through, have a chat to each other sort of, and <laughs> I'll throw in some questions as well. But throw each other 
throw it to each other as well so you, we can hear it from your perspectives if that's all right. Um, how did you guys feel, though, going down that hill and then getting onto the bridge? What sort of feelings did you just have? For me, considering I've done the course a few times, so much better, so much better because it was quite cool going downhill at first because because previously you've always had that steady incline at first. And for some reason, for me, this year the bridge didn't seem as inclining, if that's a word, as previous years. I think that's because we started with a downhill first, whereas other years it's been an uphill. Mm. So I think it was the changes they made to the course, I think I think we're done for the better. Yeah, I thought it was iconic running onto that bridge. It's just amazing. And it was interesting. I was listening to one of the um, interviews and someone was likening it to running over the Verrazano Bridge. Yeah, no. No, <laughs> no, no nowhere near running over the Verrazano Bridge. Um, and, I, yeah, I the incline, you could notice it, but it wasn't like, yeah, it was... I, it was wonderful running over that bridge. And we stopped. And once again, the amount of selfie spots oh, there are on this course is just amazing. So, you know, we stopped for some selfies there. And yeah, it was just, it was a great way to start the marathon. Yeah. Wonderful. Excellent. Excellent. And the running around Darling Harbour, I guess, would have been a nice little. Um, well, they, they actually changed it a little bit because. Previous years, you've done more around Darling Harbour, but on one side of Darling Harbour, it's undergoing a massive redevelopment. So, again, I think the change they made and how we got into Piermont, because normally when you go into Piermont, the route they've taken previously is, again, it's a steady incline, but they changed it up. Still a couple of small, small, in, small inclines, but I think, yeah, it was done a lot better because it didn't... Piedmont for me normally is not my favourite place to run, but I didn't mind it this year. Yeah, I and I had no idea where we were, so yeah. <laughs> I, I was just following the pack, and then all of a sudden you come back around, and you once again selfie spot right right under the bridge there. It's just amazing, and then you you get past that, and then there's a selfie spot for the opera house. It's just. Yeah, yeah, but I had no idea we were going through Darling Harbour. I was just following the pack. So. Awesome, <laughs> so, awesome. So, so the cheer in, in past years, it's got quite narrow through Piermont. Did that, did that change this year, fix up that? Because it didn't look like it was I, narrow on the TV this no, year. No, yeah, so previous years, there was a lot of out, out and backs as well, but they changed that a lot this year. So there weren't as many. So it was kind of, in a way, as like just a continuous line as such and it was a lot wider than previous years because Piedmont can be certain parts can be a lot sorry can be very narrow but didn't didn't feel any issues with with crowd congestion considering there was just over 20,000 people finishing mm. they, okay yes I was at the back but still um it didn't feel as crowded excellent now you're so, talking about the out and backs um, there is still a few out and backs on that course. So did you get to see people on the other yeah. side that we knew and everything yes. like so, that? As I was coming, I can't remember which, as we were going down Anzac Parade, I wish I could remember what K-Mark it was, I saw um, a good friend of the podcast, Stephen, I could never say his surname right. Tudgman. Tudgman. The sweep. I'm like, Stephen. So I literally run on the other side of the road. Um then I also saw someone that we ran in Boston with, Peter. She was one of the seven hours. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Peter so Hellman. The, yes. So I'm glad I saw them as I was going back the other way. And then at about, I think it was just about the four, close to 41K mark, I saw Tony. So I'm going into Miss McCorry's chair. Tony's coming up. So I call <laughs> out. And obviously, Tony sees me because of the balloons. So, <laughs> in which you could see people, I thought personally, I would have liked a bit more of that. But I think how the course is done, it took away a lot of the complaints from last year. So, yeah, it was, you saw people, to me, you saw people at the right times in which you needed yeah. that little bit of extra boost. Yeah, I, I, I thought the end backs were quite okay. Didn't have any 
um, issues at all. It was good to see Stevie in his role as seven-hour pacer or super sweeper, as he's known, around the parts. You could just see the amount of care that they do as the pacer group. Um, but, yeah, I found the out and backs no dramas whatsoever. I thought that last one in the quarries chair um, area was probably, that was a, a hill. That, yeah. That's the... <laughs> I, I thought there was lots of steady climbs on the course. I don't know necessarily if there was hills, but to me that was a hill. That, that um, was just before you hit that downward straight to the to the opera house, and uh, that was tough. But um, seeing Lucia at that time, because you could not miss Lucia at all. There was noise. There was balloons. There was everything. There were high fives. Um, and, yeah, probably just what I needed, to be honest, at that stage because I, I, Sharon and I ran together for the first 30 and then I was frustrating her and she just told me to go, so I, so I did. And so I'd, I'd been, what's that, about the 40K mark? So I'd, I'd done the, those 10Ks by myself and it was pretty, um, it was tough. It, it was a tough day in the course for all, for Sharon and I, but... It was just good seeing Lucia at that stage and then, um, yeah, it was just a, a wonderful finish from then. I, from, so the out and backs, I had no issue. I thought Centennial Park was quite quiet. I, I think that, and I don't know how they activate that area. I don't know how they get more people in there to cheer them on, but that was the bits that has been picked up by a, a lot on social media about how quiet it was because... There are no crowds in Centennial Park, so so I don't know how they how they lift that. And I just think running past Allion Stadium and the Sydney Cricket Ground has got a real opportunity there for some really good activation and crowd support. You know, by getting you know whether it's cricket, football, or whatever on board and create those activation zones around uh, around those concepts, but. Yeah, I, I didn't think the yeah the outbacks were fine, um, and then just coming down to that finish was just incredible. That that is the world's best finish without a doubt. Now, t now, Tony, what did you think of the tunnel or screen? Um, there was a tunnel, but there was no screen. <laughs> uh, nice concept. Was there was there any fans in that tunnel? Um, no, I didn't see any. I just saw. The Baruka guy again. He saying happy birthday to me. Yeah. Um, but I thought the the concept is great, but they because the uni is right there. They could yeah. have got uni students out. So there's work to be done. Yeah. Um, Good I'm concept. Not... I agree. Good, great yeah. concept. Um, and Sydney just needs to get behind this. Yeah. And because that was the big thing, the the crowd support when it was there was awesome. I think I heard my name called more often during Sydney than when I what you do in another in any of the other majors, and that's maybe because the the crowd's more isolated or in pockets. But um, but Sydney just Sydney people just need to get behind this because you know, and that when they start getting some bigger name elite runners there as well, that's going to help. But I think there's a real um, thing here for Sydney with celebrities as well because we read about it today that there was a couple of celebrities that ran the race but you wouldn't have known about it prior to the race so if you want people to come out and cheer on they've got to know who's you know the first stage is to get them to cheer on the known people and then stay for the ordinary people so exactly yeah. I guess maybe in Centennial Park they could set up like um, a little fair type thing you know with some yeah. You know, like drinks and like you know how they have the recovery zones yeah. and stuff like that, like a bit of a fanfare type place or something like that. Mm -hmm. Same as like around the Sydney Cricket Ground, you know, set up like bars and food stalls and stuff like that to entice people in. Maybe. Yeah, put, put, put the hoodie gurus on, I reckon. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yep. a bit of cold chisel, um, you know. Yeah. It, it was interesting. You talk, you guys aren't. Uh, are saying the hills weren't too bad. It was interesting hearing Madison DeRosio afterwards saying that out of the six majors, this is tougher. This is a tougher course than the six majors from her perspective. So 
uh, she said it was brutal on the hills. So it is interesting. Um, different people have different opinions on it, I guess. Yeah, yeah you, we, they aren't on a wheelchair, Tim. Yeah. yeah there was a, a young lady on a wheelchair, just a normal wheelchair, around so, our pace. Yes. Yeah, um, I don't know if you saw her too, Luch. And, yeah. Um, gutsy gutsy but she was having a tough time she was having a real tough time so um i would agree that it like don't get me wrong it's a tough course right and i'm certainly feeling it today in the quads and i'm certainly feeling it in my achilles right but it's not i wouldn't class it as like a boston type of hill there's steady climbs, but those downhills go for a long time too, and I love those downhills. So, yeah. Is it yeah. net downhill or is it net uphill? It's net downhill. Oh, so it wouldn't count as a world record course then, Sydney. Mm, yeah. So, um, and just the weather. I mean, last year it was too hot. This year, temps were beautiful, but it was like you're running into a tornado at times. The headwinds were <laughs> like. <laughs> I don't know, but is that normal, Lucia? Uh, but that yesterday's headwinds was not normal spring weather at all. I'm yeah. surprised on the amount. I did have to hold the balloons because I was questioning life choices yesterday, <laughs> um, and the balloons being one of them, because so many times the balloons were just hitting me in the face. So, like a few times, I'm holding them. Like the headwinds, very, very not Sydney for that time of year. Definitely. Mm. I, I, thought, I thought my bib was going to get ripped off there a That's couple of times because the wind's coming at from the side and I'm running and holding my bib in place so it doesn't tear off. So the winds were there, – there was this whirly bird. I'm running, I'm running along with uh, a couple of guys there at one stage and there's a whirly bird just whipping up all this dust. And you may have noticed that uh, Lucia has had a couple of coughs and – my voice is a bit th throaty and husky and Sharon coughed all night. And um, I, I think it was a direct reflection of how much wind and dust that was that was out there, but, um, which made it even more meritorious for us that we got through. Hey, Luch. <laughs> and you did a great job, guys. Um, so in relation to this marathon compared to the majors, Give us your rundown, Tony. Okay. So I, I did a bit of a list up now, and you may or may not agree with it all, but I, I think, you know, in the scheme of things, um, Sydney felt like a major, right? So in the scheme of things. But I was thinking there last night because we went out on the harbour cruise with Kay and Jed Mass. You may remember Kay, our listeners, from the Up Muscle episode around trail running. But, um, but I, I started thinking about major or not major, right? So here's my list that I made. So please bear with me, right? So signage, not a major, as in pre-race signage around Street the Street signage. Yeah. Expo was on a par with some other majors but needs to be better. So I'm going to give it a pass mark as a major. Runners in marathon gear before the race, right? So you, you go to New York and everyone's got their jackets on and that's not a major. So during the race, major. There was more people in finisher shirts running the Sydney Marathon than any other major, right? After the, after the race, not a major. It wasn't a thing to be seen on the streets with your medals or... Um, metal Monday, not a major. Start area, major. Urinals in start area, major. <laughs> so, signage to said urinals, not a major. Uh, <laughs> runners in the city, major. Iconic course, major. Finish line, major. Refreshments after the finish, not a major. I'm sorry, oh. Sydney. An apple, a muesli bar and a bowl of water just does not cut it. Um Communications before the event, definitely a major. That was world class and world leading, I reckon, the way they did their videos and communicated to the runners. Um, friendly vibe on the course, major. Poncho on finish, not a major. Sydney, I really needed a poncho yesterday or a silver blanket or something, and there was nothing. So, oh. not a major. 
finished crowds major, starting crowds major, selfie spots on course major. Um, just a plea here to all the majors out there, can we please have ice cold Coke? When we finish, please. Hundred <laughs> percent on that one. Yeah, that, that, that's all I want. Um, no, beer, beers, beers, beer, beers, beers, beer available at finish, not a major. So because there wasn't any, um, but and the last one is definitely the paces, and that was definitely world class. And what I what I saw with the paces, it was really interesting. Um, there might be a three hour pace up. There was one in front, and then maybe fifty meters behind, there was another. So instead of creating these roadblocks, which you normally get with paces, they created like a zone. And as long as you're in that zone, so to speak, it sort of spread those people out. And I just thought that that was just well done. I, I, I don't, <clears throat> I'm sure that that was intentional because every, every pacer group you saw that, there was, they weren't running in a clump and they weren't attracting a clump. It was really quite well done. So so I think, you know, all things said and done, Sydney definitely a major and they just need to improve a couple of things. So. Yep, and I well, guess this I, is what this is all about, isn't it? Just learning the rights and the wrongs. But, Lucia, you'd have to say it's better than last year's effort. Is that right? Oh, most definitely. Like, they took the feedback about the starting area because it was very, very congested um, and probably more transport options as well this year because Sydney's just had the Metro open recently so people could either get there by train or Metro and they were very detailed that all depending on the way you were in, the best station to get off at, there was there were signs at the station. Mm. Was that all Sydney. free for the day as well, yes. Virginia? Yeah. Yep. No, okay. Yes, cool. anyone with a race bid. Yep. Um, had feet, had free public transport to get to and from the event. So I got the train from my local train station at 5.02. I've never seen a train that busy so early. And then the metro to get to Victoria Cross was packed. So okay, it was, so was it only free for people with a bib? Is that correct? Okay, correct. so that may be one of your things there, Tony. You know how you're saying that there wasn't a lot of crowd support? Mm. Maybe if they made free public transport because i know that they make free tunnel passes because obviously the harbour bridge was shut for the day yeah. maybe yeah. if they made free public transport for everybody for the day oh, that might yeah. increase the crowd numbers i don't know yeah but quite possibly i think um the way the course is set up you can actually i, I would imagine if i was there supporting a runner you could actually see them three four five times during yep. the race, the way the, the race is set up. So yep. I, I, I think if Sydney people get behind this marathon, and they should, um, you have got so many options. You know, even, you know, someone like Jed, who doesn't know Sydney real well, he was supporting Kay, and he saw it two or three times, and that was just him muddling his way through and finding a couple of friendly people. So... Um, so I think the option is there to, to see some, your runners three to four or five times on the course easily. And so then a bit like Berlin. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, I actually have a story about that. So as we're going along Anzac Parade, this is one guy sees me because of the balloons, which is me happy birthday. And then I see him a few more times. As we're coming down Driver Avenue, I see him again. So he points out happy birthday. See him, see him and his wife on Moore Park Road. Happy, happy birthday. And, and then I get to Mr. Macquarie's chair. Happy birthday. And then as I'm coming back up, <coughs> sorry, guys, I see him and the wife again and I stop. I'm like, how many Ks have you guys done today? I'm like, are you guys stalking me or something? And at this point, we're laughing. And they're like, even though it's your birthday, don't think we're just following you. They're like, our son is not too far behind you. So that's why we've literally popped up everywhere. Oh, but wow. I reckon, I reckon I saw them about half a dozen times. Yeah, yeah. It's... Uh... The other thing I found really interesting, um, Tim, was that at the finish line, I like I finished in, my time was 6.06, which I wasn't too unhappy with. Um, I had a seven-minute toilet stop at the 5K, which annoyed me because I never have to go do wheeze while I'm running, but I had to. Um, but so 
but and Sharon came in at 6.20 or something, so there was a bit of a time gap. Uh, I just stood at the finish line and no one hustled me away, no one pushed me wow. away, no one said... So I was just hanging around and it was really funny because in my race photos, there's about 30 photos of me at the finish line <laughs> taking selfies, just sitting around <laughs> waiting. And then the other really cool thing that happened at the finish line was that um, as I'm running up to the finish, they've normally got, they had some ambassadors just out as you straighten up to the finish line and they were slapping, you know, doing high fives and whatnot. Anyway, I had no idea who they were, so I ignored them and just kept running. And um, and then there's this guy just really struggling, and I said to him, come on, mate, last big effort. And so he did a last big effort, and he beat me over the line, the, the beat. <laughs> <laughs> but then what was interesting then, while I'm sitting there, at the, standing there at the starting line and not being ushered down the corral and to move on, um, Haley came out as one of those ambassadors. So, and I thought, oh, I hope because um, you could see where SAS was. She just passed the forty k mark, and so that was a really wonderful thing for for Sharon to see. She's coming in. There's Haley doing the old. If you remember Haley from Berlin cheering Sharon and I home, yeah. very very similar. And you could just see Sharon's face just light up, and it just made that last little bit just wonderful for us so, yeah so finish line was amazing but really concerning that i could just hang around and not necessarily yeah, yeah i thought i thought security would have said come on keep moving keep moving but anyway. I, I noticed that during the telecast that they were trying to push some of the runners away and move them when they came in thick and fast but um even when the elites finished, I, I found it really surprising. The elites finished, but there was no one there to greet them when they crossed the finish line. They sort of oh. crossed the finish line and, like, the, the men's winner, he, he kept jogging for about another 20 or 30 mm. metres beyond the finish line. And normally there's somebody at those big races that puts a yeah. blanket around them or a towel, hands them some water. There was none of that when they crossed the finish line. It was pretty quiet. Um, it was almost like, oh, you've got here. Oh, okay. <laughs> um <laughs> Oh, but we weren't was, expecting it, you so soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you did set the course record yeah, in yeah. a couple of minutes, but but yeah, it was a, it was interesting because you see those majors, and as soon as they cross the finish line, there's a group of people that put around blankets around, and they've got water, they've got um, microphones to put in front of them, all the rest of it. They didn't really have that this time around, so it was mm. quite interesting seeing that. But I will, as I said earlier on. I will give a big tick to the telecast. It was a major telecast. It's not like a London where it runs all day and it has this vibe about it. Even Boston, the telecast has goes all day and it shows the finishing line. But they did run it for about an hour and a half after the, the elites crossed the finish line, which is pretty unique in Australia for any running event to show that. Yeah, uh, they, so they live stream. Happy. They live stream the finish um, all the way through. So we've got Sharon's finishing. And um, with the live stream, they had as you're coming down towards the finish line and um, and then the finish line itself. The, the only hiccup was they kept interviewing people as well, so sometimes they'd move the cameras away. But um, they've got me coming down that final stretch. They didn't get me coming over the finish line because they were interviewing someone. So they got me coming down the final stretch, and I must say I'm looking strong. And then... <laughs> And then with, they get Sharon coming over, which is just, yeah, she looked really good at the end. So really, really, once again, just incredibly proud of my wife for putting up with what she had to put up with and, you know, putting up with me for 30K as well. So <laughs> just, just training, annoying her. Yeah, Just a normal a training, training run. run. Yeah, yeah, just for, a normal training, training run. run. Yeah. Absolutely. And now you're both wearing your shirts and your medals. Um yeah. They are very, very fancy looking shirt um, and really nice medals because they're spinners as well. They're really yeah. nice looking metal, actually. Are you guys happy with the quality of shirts yeah. and medals? Yep. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. I think, <laughs> the last, I think we finished the shirt this year, even just the quality. So on the Shake Out run I did Saturday, I wore last year's finished t shirt. And, and, as we were, and as we were going down Macquarie Street, I had a guy say to me, oh, how can you wear that? You haven't even run it this year. I'm like, mate, it's last year's one. Oh, that's all right. Good luck. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. But it was, 
it wasn't. You don't get one of these unless you actually finish. <laughs> no, they, no, they changed it this year. So this year, you picked up your finishers shirt at the expo. Oh. Yeah. So the same as Boston, where you get your finished yeah. shirt before you finish. Yep. Yeah, and it was just weird because people were wearing oh. them out on the course. But the other thing, and Luch, maybe you, you would have seen this as well. The amount of people I saw on course with that bag, just hold that yeah. bag up again. So this was the um, the baggage um, the, bag the drop, bag yes. drop, right? And you couldn't do bag drop at start line. You had to do it at the expo. So you had to take your stuff, leave it there, and put your your name on it and all that sort of stuff. But the amount of people I saw running with it was incredible. So I reckon there would have been, you know how we said communication was excellent and world class prior to the event. I, I stand by that because there's always going to be some people who don't read or don't watch or don't um, listen to the communication. Um, but I saw so many people running with those bags on their backs. They just referenced um, the drawstring. Yeah, mm -hmm. with a drawstring. Because some of them had their baggage, you know, the big, the size of the bib, the the baggage, the bag drop number on those bags. So I reckon a lot of people miss that communication. But they could I, don't, I, I don't know what else Sydney could have done because that was all over the place. So it couldn't have been made any clearer. Yeah. No bag drop on race day except for the age group championship. Yeah, I think maybe the age group champions was awesome, but I think it did cause some confusion and I think there was some um, negativity around because the age group were inside North Sydney Oval and the other waves were outside in the surrounding parks, for want of another word, and they relied on the plumbing in North Sydney Oval for the age group chance, right? So when I say plumbing, they relied on the toilets there. So there were no additional porta potties. Um, within North Sydney Oval itself for the age group championships. So a lot of the age group championships are saying, oh, they, Sydney needs to get more porta, porta potties. And there were, I couldn't see any. And that's because they had the age group champs inside North Sydney Oval and then the, the general public pretty much outside North Sydney Oval with plenty of porta potties. So yeah. in my mind anyway, plenty of porta potties. What do you do? So after the race, you don't get your shirt, you get your medal only, and you said there was no poncho or no, no. wraparound no. foil blanket or anything? No. And yesterday was definitely a day, as Tony said earlier, you needed something because I had arm sleeves on, So, but I, it was the wind. The temperature mm -hmm. wasn't too bad. It was just the wind. But just to have, like, the, the space blanket or a poncho would have something. been... Perfect. And yeah. I guess if you haven't done that bag drop because you're like, well, I, I don't really actually need one, yeah. you're really up, yeah, yeah. Up the creek without a paddle, aren't you? So yeah. that's if, not real. If I knew we weren't getting like a, a silver blanket, at the very least most of the majors do a silver blanket, right? Mm -hmm. At New York you get a silver blanket, then you get the poncho. Yes. At Berlin you get the silver blanket. So, um yeah, so I, I was ex I was hoping for one. I wasn't expecting one. I was hoping for one. And if I knew that the day was going to be like it was, I would have done a bag drop with a bag in it. So but that I, that's I guess that's on me more than Sydney. So I can't I, blame the weather. I guess they're looking at last year and comparing it and going, Well, who would have needed a silver foil blanket last year? So yeah. um you've gone from one extreme to the other and, and maybe next year will be more in the in the teens. The the the, the numbers will be probably around seventeen or eighteen degrees rather than twelve degrees. So mm. But in saying that, one. Tim, the year we did dopey, it was freezing cold for the first two days yeah. and they gave us foil blankets and then the next yeah. two days it was extremely hot and they actually gave us cool towels that we got to take home with us so they I have prepared for everything i've still got mine yeah. too lucia so um they do need to prepare for everything um weather in sydney is very variable and that might be a nice little um feedback thing if you guys get a feedback form or you know you do your surveys um okay, something like today. that in there yeah um so with 
everything that's gone on, do you ultimately think that Sydney can handle the 50,000 people that are going to be needed when it becomes like a London or something like that? Because, look, let's face it, but um, Boston is the smallest of the majors at 28,000. Um, I think they're trying to increase that. But most majors are up around about that 50,000 um, for that. Is Sydney able to handle that, do you think? Personally, I think the most they could go up to is probably about 30,000 because the finish, as much as it's iconic, you cannot be that finish. It's the post-finish area. It's not very big unless they redesign it somehow and have the finishes go on the side of the opera house kind of that way. But how it, how it stands now, if they were to increase it any more than by, let's say, cap it at 30,000, any more than that, I think it'd be too much. The space just wouldn't work. Yeah, I, I agree with Luch. I, I think it would be challenging to get that huge numbers, much more than what they did. Um, and when you when they funnel you out of the Sydney um, Opera House, it's actually an uphill climb yeah. back to say things like bag drop, and um, the amount of people that were struggling with that grassy climb up a hill, uh, like me. <laughs> Um, yeah, so so I think if they were to, if they would have to stagger it to get larger numbers, and I don't know how receptive Sydney would be with that. I thought the early start was ideal, um, and um, even though some runners had complained it was too early, you're never going to please anyone, everyone. Um, but um, yeah, I couldn't see any more than 30,000 ever running Sydney. So. Okay, so that's an interesting thought. Um, will you go back next year to do it, I guess, is the biggest question. If it becomes a major, will you do it? Or if it doesn't become a major, will you do it? For me, it's my home one, so yes. Like either way, but I'd say 99.9%, .9 I'll be getting my seventh star next year. Okay. Yeah. If they if they're a major, and you know, by all reports, it look, it does look, let's say, extremely promising. But I'd hate Sydney people to get really cocky about getting the major and then not having it come through. So I'm I'm glad they're confident. If it's a major, we'll be back to run it next year. Okay, so. excellent. And you said that's in November, Luch. The get, one out there. Yeah, it will get announced, but. From the information I've got, it's pretty much a certainty. But yeah. okay. still, until it's officially announced. Yeah. And I guess we're waiting on that Cape Town marathon to still be run and oh. Chendu still to be run, Tim? Yeah, yeah Chendu's uh, late October, I think. Yeah, but okay. I think, so that's why we're waiting for November, right? But You've I also got Chicago and New York. But I think with um, Cape Town, that they didn't get – they didn't they pass the last year. So yes. they've still got to do two successive years and yep. no one knows where Chendu is. So <laughs> I don't think Chendu knows where Chendu is. So <laughs> all right, let's um go to the next thing. Um does anybody else want to add anything else to this podcast before we get Tim's tip at all? Or no, I, I go thought... ahead with it. I thought, well done, Sydney. Glad yeah. we did it. Um, really stoked to have been part of it. Um, run the race prior to it being a major, I think, is something that I'll look back on quite fondly. Um, just an iconic course. Loved it. Yes, they do need to have some improvements, please, just on a, a couple of little things. And Sydney people, get behind this race. If it's a major... We've got to get people into Centennial Park. I don't care how you do it. Form a Congo line and drag people down there. Get Stephen Tudgeman down there as the crowd sweeper because I saw how he was sweeping people up towards the end of that race. So um, there are. we've got to find a way to some of these quiet spots on the course. We've got to fill them. So. Absolutely. Yep. No, definitely get behind it, Sydney, guys. And even if you're... Um, from a different part of Australia or you just want to see from a different part of the world and you want to see Sydney and you want to come and visit, come and visit and get behind it. So that would be great. Um, let's get your tip then, Tim, for the week. Yeah, I don't have much of a tip this week other than to say 
how awesome is big city racing listening to Lucia and, and tony go on tonight about uh their experiences in sydney it brings back a lot of memories for us of other big city races we've done around the world um and what it shows is that anyone can really do it there was twenty five thousand runners out there yesterday anyone can really do it so um i really encourage everyone to get out there and have a go at a big city marathon at some stage um it's not just for the elites it's not for the super fast uh you can do it you've just got to know the right way to get in and to do some of these events generally it's going in early into ballots or early into entries um but whatever you have to do um definitely put it on your bucket list to do at least one big city marathon around the world because it it's a fantastic experience it is um one of those things that you you recall fondly in your life you'll always be looking at it uh always reminiscing when you look at your medals um it's just a fantastic experience so my tip is get out there and try a big city marathon excellent yep absolutely 100 percent agree with you there tim so um next week tony we're going to have a special guest on do you want to have a chat about our black current experts yeah absolutely thanks tara and um for those people watching i am a bit red in the face today because of all that wind and sunburn that i got yesterday out on the course but um uh, yeah i'm not um dying or anything and i certainly haven't eaten too much blackberry ax extract so but um, yeah, next week we're going to be joined by Fleur Cushman. Now, you've heard Tara go on about the benefits of uh, blackberry extract and how it has current? helped her. Black current. Black current. Black current. Yes. Sorry, Tim's uh, written the wrong thing in there. Okay, <laughs> black current extract, and now he's now he's changing it. So he's uh, it's helped her with her gastrointestinal issues when running. So. Fleur is the head of Cura NZ, the manufacturer of the extract. So on next week's show, we'll talk to Fleur about the benefits of uh, of Cura NZ and what it can do to help improve your performance. As usual, looking forward to this one. It's definitely an episode you don't want to miss. Now, you'll just have to excuse Tony for that because Tim was actually changing the run sheet <laughs> in front of Tony's eyes as he was trying to read that. So that is not Tony's fault. That is Tim. And Tim had actually written it down as Blackberry because Tim was probably it's half asleep current. when he was writing this. It is definitely yeah. black current and it is the most Absolutely. amazing stuff ever. I had, um, a, yeah. had, a, had a few things on my mind last week when I was typing this all up, so I'm yes. sure I can be excused about that. Um, so <laughs> thanks, Tony and Tim. Um, that wraps up our episode. Um, I'd like to thank... Um, my marathon mates for joining me tonight. Um, thank you very much, Tony and Lucia. I know that you'll be both very tired and Tony, you're still in Sydney, so thank you. Um, as always, um, for all of our wonderful listeners, thank you as well. We couldn't do it without you. Um, our numbers are always continuing to grow um, and the more feedback and the more likes we get, the more that it's going to happen. So thank you so much. We love hearing it um, about all your feedback. So if you want to give us any please do and um leave a comment on our socials we've got facebook messenger or email and we've also got a web page as well which tony do you want to yeah so you can email us now at happy running at flying runner.com so um, for any all those sponsorship offers that people no doubt will one day start sending our way excellent excellent yes absolutely so and as usual Video of this episode will be available at Spotify and YouTube and audio will be on Apple and Amazon and most other popular podcast platforms. Remember, every step forward is a victory. Lace up, hit the road, and we'll catch you on the next episode of The Flying Runner. Until then, happy running. Happy, happy running. running. Happy running. <laughs>